put on the screen. All right. So here we are today. As I said before, we're deviating a little bit from the topic of food, uh, but it was too good an opportunity uh, to miss uh, talking to Pavlo Luniv, our special guest today, um, a parish priest, a judicial vicar, a canon lawyer, and somehow he's also found the time to become a master of Pisankai, an, an art. He's an artist, and I don't know. I feel like it's both an art and a craftsmanship. So it's um, yeah, it's such an honor to have you here with us today, Paolo. Where are you? It looks like daylight where you are. Yes, I'm here in Terryville, Connecticut. And first of all, I'd like to thank you, Olya, and all the Patreons for having me here this afternoon so that I can share my talent, uh, the work I've done over the years with you. So I'm here in Terryville, Connecticut, which is about two hours from New York and about two hours from Boston. It's in between here. And I'm in the parish here, St. Michael's in Terryville. And you quite rightly said, all the hats I wear, there's one more that I have, and that is chaplain for emergencies at the local, ho well, the, the Connecticut Hospital in Yukon. So I do that as well. So I'm happy to learn. I'm happy to be here with you all this afternoon to share the art of Pisanke with you, some of the history and indeed the technique. Amazing. Um, so first of all, you are in the US, but actually uh, your parents came from Ukraine after the Second World War. They were displaced Ukrainians um, and they they came to Halifax, uh, north north of the UK. And, the, and you were born in Halifax. Um, and just before we begin with your personal story and kind of like with the history of Pisanke and everything, what is Pisanke? And for those who don't know what, what this, what the technique is as well, just briefly explain how it's done because they look like, you know, pieces of art and you'd think, oh, they must be painted with the daintiest of brushes. But of course, it's not a brush that you use to 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 paint on them so could you please tell us what pisanke is and how do you put those beautiful patterns on onto them pisanke the word comes from the word ukrainian word to pisati which means to write it's writing and scribing on an egg and it is a wax batik method using a stylus beeswax and a candle and i do have here the stylus, which I can show you. It's known as a kistka. But I also have the very old stylus that my father made for me many years ago, of blessed memory. And he would take a tin of soup or a can of peas, and he would cut the metal off and turn it on a needle, and it would be this little sort of instrument here with a little funnel at the other side. This would be put into a piece of wood, and this you would use for uh, decorating uh, pisanke. And of course, you must have beeswax because it comes in different colors, of course, today. But pure, it must be pure beeswax because of its high melting point and it preserves the colors on the, uh, the egg itself. And then having the, the beeswax, you also need the candle. The candle, in, and towards the end, I'll show you uh, the end of the process and you know how we begin and if you like i can show you the process now in different stages if you like just how we start with the colors or sure. you want to leave that till later it's up just, to you just yeah maybe, maybe that's a good idea actually just so everyone can kind of understand just how much work and how intricate this work is and how special the technique is well before we go into the history of things i have a history of my own eggs here and so I can show you with some of my very old eggs that I did here. Here's an old one, which was done, I won't say 10 years ago, maybe probably 50 years ago. This is how I started. It was a once upon a time session with my mother in the kitchen in Halifax. But of course, since then, over the years, I've evolved uh, Pisanke to something like this, as you can see here. Oh, gosh. Now, well, that is... I'm going to explain the symbolism of the different eggs, but I use different eggs. So these are the chicken eggs I use. You can see. Yep. I also use 
turkey eggs. Wow, yeah. I, I use a bantam egg. I use a lovely rear egg. Right. And finally, I use this small egg, the ostrich egg. <laughs> Fantastic. So I, those are the eggs I use. But then we go one step further. The smallest one I use is this, the quail egg. And so I also have finch eggs, just to show you the difference between the quail egg and the ostrich egg. There's quite a difference. So, so, those you've, are the got eggs your, so you've got your egg, then you've got your wax, and you, you start putting the wax on, on the white yes. egg. I'm and then to, start I'm dipping going... into dyes from from yes. light dyes to dark. Yeah. Yes. I've got the process here. Right. The Let's... dyes many years ago, I used to use crepe paper. That's crepe paper was very prevalent everywhere. Today it's still around, but it's not the same as it was then. And I used to immerse the crepe paper in a jar with hot water and white distilled vinegar. Right. And this would be the dye. And then also I would buy dialon, the stuff that I used to buy it in the local market in Halifax. This was the stuff that you would use to dye fabrics with. And so those were the things initially that I started with. But having mentioned the candle, there's one more thing that I used to use. With my father turning the metal piece on a needle, I used to have a lamp burning with a little sort of container on top, which would melt the wax. And I would dip the stylus into the wax. On my thumb here, I would sort of, with the remnant, wipe it off and then scribe on the egg. This was those early days. But just to show you uh, today, th basically the process, here you have a, 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 a regular white egg that mm -hmm. I would start with. And I would scribe on this egg a design with the stylus, with the beeswax and the candle. It's a bit difficult to show the whole process yeah. on uh, the video with all this stuff, but just very basically. Then this would go into the yellow dye. And mm -hmm. The yellow dye, I have the dyes here in a little plastic jar. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you come to my kitchen, there's about 15 dyes there on the kitchen shelf. The cleaning lady's not coming tomorrow because it's such a mess here with all the dyes and everything. So we have the different colors here. And today I just uh, brought one or two. It then immersed the whole egg into yellow. And so you can see the whole egg is yellow on mm -hmm. this side. But on this side, I've already done the design, which is this, with the white and the yellow has now been completed. The important part is to try and get very fine lines. And over the years, I've become known for doing pisanke with fine lines, because many people use, use thick styluses that make thick lines, which you can use as well. When this is finished, you work from the light color to the dark color. So it'd be yellow, green, orange, red, and then a dark background color, which would be dark blue, royal blue, black, or dark brown. And so each time, and it, before before you dip it into the next color, you do another uh, kind yes, of set yes. of, uh, of wax, right? Yes. E each time you apply the beeswax to the egg, what stays on the egg, the beeswax that covers the color, stays on there until the finished product. So this would be the red egg now. And mm -hmm. on here, as you see, for practical purposes, I've already shaded in the parts here, the black part, with beeswax. So this right. will all be red. And this now is ready for the dark color. Mm -hmm. So we, we immerse this egg into the dark color. And when you take the egg out, it's dark. And it actually looks like this. This is an egg I've just worked on. In fact, this is one of the lockdown eggs, which I haven't taken the wax off because I'm doing photography on this, hopefully for a book which is going to come out in the future. So I'm doing these uh, lockdown eggs very soon. I'll be melting the wax off. This is what the egg looks like when it's all finished with the color. It looks a mess full of wax and everything. So now I've done the dark color here. And I've melted the wax off. And I could sort of demonstrate a little bit later how to melt a bit of the wax off. And when you've melted the wax off, this is the finished product. 
Oh, wow. So you melt the, the, the and all of those colors have been preserved by the... All the colors wax. have been yeah. preserved because of the beeswax. It yeah. must be beeswax, not candle wax. Right. You know, because candle wax, the, the dye will go through it or you will lose your lines. So this is something that was um, uh, finished. Uh, this is what I use when I give the talks and demonstrate the finished products that we have here. So this is uh, the general process. And I say, I've got the red, the dark and different colors in the kitchen. But it becomes a little more complicated to dye eggs when you want to do something like this. This is magenta and aquamarine blue. And you so mix your you... own colors, don't you? Like an artist. Yes, it's mixing colors and learning to um, work from the light to the dark colors. But this is difficult. It takes um, a lot of practice and you can ruin a lot of eggs if you don't you know, follow the process, as I say, the coloring scheme that we have here. Didn't somebody Maybe, ask you once if you use a computer to make it so oh, easy? Yes. <laughs> yes. When I've had the journalists here, the television, they asked me once, did you use a computer to do this? I said, no. And then they said to me, are these decals? I said, no. We said, well, how do you do it? I said, well, you could take a measure, but it's difficult. Everything is done with the eye. And I can give you an example of something here, which uh, it was very difficult to do. This is an ostrich egg with 40 eggs on the egg. This oh. was very difficult to do because not so much the designs in the 40 eggs, but marking the whole egg out so it's symmetrical. And this egg symbolizes the 40 days of Lent and our 40 facets of life. We may have more facets of life, but certainly this is one of the examples of, of dividing an egg into the different parts. And this is for all the eggs that I've done over the years. Oh, and Lord, and is, is, is the 40 egg thing, is that a, tra is that a traditional, ha have other people have done that like that? Or was that your idea to do this? It, it was my own idea. I took it from, well, in the Old Testament, 40 is a number. And in the New Testament, 40 is a number. And I thought to myself, what would it be like to put 40 eggs on an ostrich egg? And I thought it would, it would be difficult because marking the egg out, and I did use a pencil to begin with because everything is freehand, but to mark the egg out was difficult because you have to, as you go further up, as I can show you here, the, the higher up you go, you see the egg gets smaller. Right. So you can get yeah. the 40 eggs on. And each one of them has their own design. I mean, that is just... Each, each egg on here, the 40 eggs, have a different design and all very symbolic. So this is the one I did. This I call sort of the master, one of the masterpieces because this one, everyone is fascinated by this one Nostrich eggs with the 40 eggs on. Paolo, and let's just, let, let's just a little bit further back. Yeah, it was a little bit, uh, Paolo, just to say, so you said, so for this one, okay, you did like a, a bit of a kind of like a, you say that you don't even plan them out on a piece of paper. You literally just do some simple lines with a pencil on the egg sometimes, and then you just yes. go completely, just yes. how it kind of comes I, out of you. I, I immerse totally into the life of a pesanka. No, you know, my concentration like for your designs, they just come out. You, yes, there's no kind yes. of meditation. So, sometimes I may scribble something on a sheet of paper and I kept those old papers, you know, some little squiggles here, lines and things like that. But when I decided I'm going to do the 40 eggs on this particular egg, it wasn't so much, you know, doing the design on the egg that would come later. The problem was marking the egg yeah. out. And that's the problem for most of the designs. Uh, you know, I have uh, some, well, another egg I have, which I can show you maybe a little bit later. This is a very intricate one. If you can see this here. A little bit further back, not so close to the camera. Yeah, perfect, like this. Amazing. Wow. This is, now this was done totally freehand. I just decided I'm going to divide this egg into the eight parts. And I worked from the middle upwards 
and uh, made my own design this way. Is but it... again, it took time to do this. It took, um, it's the marking out of everything. But this one wasn't marked out. I only did the middle outline first and then worked away from it. The one, the other ostrich egg that I did mark out, this one is also very interesting. A bit, a bit, a bit up towards you. Yeah, and don't move it too much. Yes, just so we can see the detail a little bit. This little egg, bit is, this egg uh -huh. is divided into four. Yeah. To symbolize the four corners of the world and also symbolizing the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But also the same design is on the top here to symbolize the heavens. And on below, you see the earth. And it does have a hole in because yeah. ostrich eggs are normally bought when they're blown out. Sure. So this is one. This also was very difficult to do because of the intricacy. And these eggs take three or four months to do, maybe six months. You have to do a little bit at a time, walk away from it, and then come back to it. Incredible. And so these were the, the processes I've used for the different eggs over the years. And if you're still interested in looking at a process, these are hard to do, these tiny little things. <laughs> They're not easy. If you, when you get it, you get it like this, and then you try and finish it like this. These actually, the ones that are really brittle are the finch eggs, which I have on display at the moment. I have one little tiny finch egg in a little container. Those, I think I brought maybe a hundred of those. They're so brittle, you have to be quick. These also, when you use the stylus here, they tend to come out thick on the shell. So you've got to try and work quickly so it doesn't come out very thick. So these are just the little ones I have here. Oh, then if you... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just um, throw you back, sorry, into your childhood a little bit, because I want to hear a little bit about your mom, about Tekla and about your amazing... Uh, Tato Vasil as well. So they came, so they came to Halifax. Um, they would, so they were displaced Ukrainians. You lived, you know, with the Ukrainian diaspora in Northern England. And was it a normal thing for Ukrainians to, to do pisanki? Because I, I come from the south of Ukraine, and you know, we did krashenki. We just painted eggs for Easter, and my mom would take them to the church and you know get them blessed, etc. But pisanki, it was just. I think in the south and eastern Ukraine, things just kind of, you know, disappeared and, and, and all of the stuff was really discouraged. But how common was it? Was your mom an exception or did quite a lot of people do Pisanki for Easter in, in the diaspora in Halifax? Well, as mentioned, I was born in Halifax, the, the West yeah. Riding of Yorkshire there. And of course, I grew up there. And so as a little boy, I used to... The seats of the table, they had all their things for Easter. And it was always like she would do it on Holy Thursday or Good Friday, as you said, ready to put in the basket to bless the food. The eggs she did were somewhere krashanki, and she would put a pin into a piece of wood, then dip it into the into the be the wax of the candle flame, and it would be a form of drop technique. But then she would take the beeswax and make some pisanke. But bearing in mind, the krashanke were boiled eggs, so you could eat those. So when my mother did pisanke, she didn't do anything exceptional because they were boiled eggs. And when you boil the egg, the shell is not the same. You find that the colors are different, the wax, but nevertheless, it was something that was there that intrigued me. And so as a little boy, I would sit there and finally sit with my mother and we would start doing these eggs together. Now, interestingly enough, my mother was the critique of the eggs. And um, sometimes the, she would melt the wax off for me as I developed my technique. And she would criticize, this line is crooked. The color hasn't taken here. And she was the first person to critique my eggs, which I loved and respected. But she would it melt the wax it off. It didn't put you off. It didn't no, put you off, no. No, actually, it gave me encouragement to be more of a perfectionist. But when you mention about others in England, people doing it, I only remember 
two other people doing it where we lived. There was a lady who once in a while would make a dye for my mother. And she said, I've made you a dye tackler. And I would go up to the house and get the dye. I think it was green, if I remember. Mm -hmm. And there was a man there who was a hutu who used to do sort of very basic eggs. And he brought the tradition from Ukraine. But really, nobody did it. And nobody really knew about the eggs. And when you showed it to the English people, they didn't understand. They, they thought they were very nice, but they didn't connect this to anything at all and in fact the culture was kind of we were embarrassed with some of the the culture that we had because if you if you know that on on palm sunday we don't bless palms we bless pussy willow and on my eggs which i'll show you later i have pussy willow so even the, the locals couldn't understand until i explained to them that the first tree to bloom in the spring is the pussy willow. It's a symbol of new life, both in the pagan world and in the Christian world. And when you explain to them, some of it registered, some of it didn't. And uh, not many people understood our traditions. And certainly we were afraid as well, and we felt insecure. And in fact, sometimes we felt that, you know, should we say something or don't say anything? Because some people would laugh. In fact, I remember giving some eggs. My mother gave two eggs to somebody and they were boiled. They were pissed on case, something I'd done on a boiled egg. And the people came back and said, it was a shame to use them for scrambled eggs. And I felt quite hurt because all the hours I'd spent on the eggs and I realized the people hadn't understood what was what. It wasn't until I had the first television program, Blue Peter, that's when everything began to evolve. How this... did you get onto that program? For those who are in America and might not know, Blue Peter is, well, kind of an institution, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah. a really famous UK program. And how did you get onto Blue Peter? That was 1970s, was it? Yes, it was. And it, it happened that um, somebody had seen my eggs on display somewhere in London. And they had contacted someone and they contacted the BBC and Blue Peter was a magazine program that was on Mondays and Fridays from five o'clock till 5.30. There were three people on. And uh, I, I, the, the one lady is still alive. The other two have died. But uh, they invited me to come down to the studio and demonstrate those eggs, which I did. And this went live all over the UK. And it was from that that I got recognized and started to be asked to go and demonstrate and explain the art of Pisanke. But again, in those initial days, my work was very primitive. As I showed you that first egg, it was it was very primitive. It was nothing to get excited about. So it was as the I would be lucky to make an egg like that. It's <laughs> it's really it hard. Was, I... It was as the weeks went on. And the years, when the months and years went on, I began to develop my own technique. And certainly the first eggs I used were all full eggs, but they weren't boiled. They were, they were raw eggs. So I would decorate the eggs on these raw eggs until you came to the end. And as I showed you earlier, this is another one that's finished, ready to be blown. This is a lockdown egg as well. Mm -hmm. And I would then seal the bottom of the egg here. In fact, I'll take a real egg here and just in one of these eggs here, I would seal the bottom here of this egg with beeswax. And as, as when my mother welted, melted the wax off, you'd see the design. But then I'd make a hole in the bottom and then blow the content out. I used to use a syringe, a little blower, and we'd remove the content. But unfortunately, my family, my three sisters, my mother and father found that revolting and disgusting which they did, because it wasn't very nice. And the reason of putting the beeswax at the bottom of the egg was because if you let the content get on the dye, it was sort of acidity, it could bleach the dye Change or it. even yeah. fade the color. So this was the reason, those were those initial days. Today, I work on blown eggs, some of them, but those are difficult to use as well, because when you immerse them in the dye, the eggs float. 
And that's one of the issues you have to deal with today because you have to seal the hole. And if you don't seal the hole properly, you find that the dye goes into the egg and it can seep through. So you have to remove the little plug there of beeswax that you put in and let it drain. Okay, Paolo, I'm going to move you into another area of things now. I'm going to ask you about history. So from pagan times to Christianity, I mean, these, this tradition is yes, a really, really old the, tradition. The, can you tell us a little bit about history? Um, I can. Yeah. The, the, the whole aspect of Pisanke began in pagan times. It was to do with the coming of spring. It was to do with sun over darkness, spring over winter, and life over death. So when the spring came, the pagans believed this was the beginning of the new life. But it also made them think about how we came into being. And they believed it was sort of like an egg, an explosion that we all came into being. They didn't know about Genesis or the creation that God had done all those years. Uh, the seven days created the heaven, the earth, and all of us in, in, together. And so that's what initially they believed in. And certainly in those early days, they were very superstitious. So they would look, of course, look to the elements. And as you know, that... Um, when you look at the elements today, and certainly the weather can be hostile and unpredictable as it is today. And those things that were hostile and unpredictable were sort of awe-staking for those people alive. They looked at those things that they saw with fear and also with awe. And in certain respects, they would worship those elements and deify them. When I say deify them, like they made them out of God, made them to be some sort of gods. So when you looked at the the trees, the moon, the stars, the stones and water, these things became deified things to be worshipped because of the spring coming, life beginning. And really, they also thought that the egg. The, the life was like this huge egg here, which I showed you earlier. Mm -hmm. And what it is, when it breaks open, you have this egg would represent the heavens. When the egg breaks open, the membrane would be the clouds. The watery part, the, the clear part is the water. And the yolk in the middle would be the earth. And then when the egg bro broke, out came this lifeless limb and the life would begin. And this is what made them curious about how we came to be. One of the early symbols on the egg, the Trapillion designs, and I do have a Trapillion egg here somewhere. And Just um, to explain to those to who don't know anything about Trapillion culture. So that's yeah, the Trapillion, culture that was on the territory of Ukraine, but thousands. Yes, it was thousands of years before Christianity, Trapillion. It was these people, they believed they had like the serpent was, the, the, the serpent would divide the egg into two. It would be the upper world and the lower world. Mm -hmm. And of course, the serpent was the goddess of the earth and under earth. And they deified that. But the Trapillion eggs were basically just very simple colors like this. It yeah. was a dark background mm -hmm. and you'd have brown colors, which symbolized the earth. And then, of course, the orangey color would symbolize the sun that mm -hmm. warms the earth. So this was the Trapillion culture that they had so many years ago, where they worshipped, um, you know, the deities that they had. But then we go on to how did they color these early eggs? Well, they didn't have the dyes that we have today. Sure. They would use the different things that we see in agriculture. And in fact... Most of the eggs, in fact, all the eggs were focused on something from agriculture, something in the land. And so they would use for a yellow color, the bark of a wild apple tree, the husks of buckwheat, they would use as a color, onion skins, mm -hmm. beetroot, and then lilac and different flowers. And these things they would use to color the eggs. 
I've never used them apart from onion skins and apart from beetroot. And yes, they come out. They're very different. They're good to use when you have a boiled egg. And that's what the early primitive people would do. But having said that, with them having one tradition in one part of Ukraine, Trapillion was a culture thousands of years ago, but different areas of Ukraine would do different eggs. Mm -hmm. And as I told Olya the other day, I had a surprise for her because I, the other night, spent five hours creating an egg from her son. And here it is. Oh, Paolo, this is so nice. This is really this, touching. And on top, you can just about see the, it's very smoked. It was done very, sort of rushed. These would be the, um, that you have in Kherson, the, the, the different foods that you have, the sort of the uh, melons and things like that, the watermelons and things that you have there. So this I did for you as a surprise. This is Kherson. And you can see the line going down, no beginning, no end. And that's on all the designs they symbolize eternity. Oh, thank you so much for doing that. <laughs> now, oh, when I you... come to when I come to England, we have to meet, and I'll be home oh, soon. Thank you. How mm -hmm. did you? How did you? <coughs> how, Excuse me. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of like the uh, regionality, or different colors that are used in different regions? Was black a color? Because I know that black and red is used a lot in Kherson <laughs> in the south of Ukraine, and Vishivankas, you know, in the embroidery. And I'm just mm -hmm. wondering if there's a little bit of, um, of a similarity. A Between the embroidery and Vishivankas, there is a connection with the, um, uh, the, the dyes and the colors. Black was always used as a background color, but it was all, it would also symbolize something to do with the unknown or death. And the design on the Pesanka would be the gift of life, that from this unknown comes the beginning of life. So the dark colors were always there to bring out the light colors. But the different areas of Ukraine definitely had different designs. One of the most popular designs with the Shevanka, I think it's Poltava, is the roses and the stars, if I remember. And um, the stars were very prevalent in the ancient world because the star you would see late afternoon in the evening at night and in the early hours of the morning and what it was was the star in the early tradition was thought to have the keys to the heavens that would open the heavens and allow the sun to go into the sky that was one of the traditions but also in the early hours of the morning, the morning dew that would fall on the ground would allow the bees to come and pollinate and make honey as a gift of life. So that's one of the traditions that would be, and those were done sort of red stars and uh, with black. They would always went together, red and black. But also the star would symbolize love. Would The red color symbolized of love. It's a symbol of blood. And also the star in the Christian sense is what was over Bethlehem when Jesus was born. Perhaps I can show you a star here, which I have somewhere. It's, um, oh, here it is. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I've got so many eggs on the table. You see, <laughs> to... This is a star, you see. One of the stars I've done. Yeah, gorgeous. And then this is the side of the star here. And that's to see no beginning and no end of all the designs there. And of the, as you see at the front, the star reaching out to the four corners of the world with the various vibrant colors. That's beautiful. Paolo, and you mentioned in our kind of preliminary talk that we had that also, you know, the different um, regional symbols were taken really from the locality, from whatever was around people, which, you know, just totally makes sense, doesn't it? It does. So in the Hutu region, they did very intricate work because the Hutus were known for the woodwork, the carvings and the different things they did. And certainly their eggs were also very Hutu orientated because of the traditions and the certain the intricacy of what they did. When you went all over Ukraine, as you went Poltava and Chernivtsi and these other areas, 
there would be a lot of red and black, but everything would be taken from the uh, the area that people were living. So, for example, in the extreme east where you had the sunflowers, people would put sunflowers on the pesanka with yellow, the yellow that they have there and the green, and also the the greenery of the plant vegetation that they had in the area. Like in Kherson, they had watermelons and the different agriculture there, which was very rich because the soil was rich. So depending on the area they were in, they would use, as those early people did in pagan times, the traditions and the agriculture of what they had in their area. Sure, and loads of wheat as well, and in your a wheat and loads of fish. I also see in your yes. designs. Can you show us? The, and now I'm going to um, show you the wheat. I've got two here that I'd like to show you. Here is an egg divided into four. If you just yeah, and just pause, yeah, very slowly. You yeah, can yeah, see yeah. The, and then you can see the wheat, but the wheat, the the egg is divided into a very different shape. It goes this way around. Yeah. But there are four. The wheat is there. That's the symbol of life. That's the bread of life is the wheat. And also in the Old Testament, the manna that flew that came down from the desert. Uh, in the old, when Moses was taking people into the desert. So, and then of course the horizontal and vertical lines in the different forms here. No beginning, no end. One of the most popular eggs I have which many people ask me to do, especially for weddings, I think I mentioned it to Euler the other day, is this one. This is the wedding egg. These are the towels, the rushnike. You have one, two towels for the bride and the groom, and then you have the one towel ties the hands together. This is what the church does. And then you have the wheat in between because the young couple are always greeted at the reception with bread and salt. It's the korovai, that they'll always have bread on the table and they will be the salt of the earth. So this is one of my very popular eggs. Can you see clearly? Yeah. The wedding egg. Uh, then you mentioned the fish. Yes, we have, yes. Uh, we have um, a rear egg here, a sort of small egg here, as you see, it's a rather large one. And this is, I'll show you a smaller version as well. This, this is, is one of my favorite color palettes that you have. Okay. This, this uh, kind I've of got the other one. Is blue, oh, blue is your favorite color. Oh, that's good to know. It's, that then. Well, it's it's this, I don't know, the combination of what you've got there. It's like this malachite kind of pale. I don't know. It's just so beautiful. Yes, it, it's, a, it's a light blue, aquamarine blue, and a dark blue with white. On here, you can see the cross in its different forms. And at the side, you can see the pussy willow. Mm hmm Can you can you uh, where, 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 if you turn a little bit, sorry. Yeah, turn it towards us. Turn it towards us. Turn, turn, turn more. Towards the camera. Yeah, that's it. There's the that's pussy willow. The, you see the, the pussy willow. On the, 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 yeah. on the side here, you can see the fish. <laughs> the beautiful. fish is an old Greek term known as Ixtos, which means Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. They were found in the early catacombs in Rome, but they were also found in mythology in Greece, and they found their way to eggs. The early pagans would put fish on the eggs, but in the Christian symbol was that Jesus looked for fishers of people to follow him. So can you see the fish clearly on this? Yeah, 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 we can see them okay. pretty well, yeah. And I'll show you a smaller version of the um, fish here, which I have. This is one... Again, similar, but this egg is divided into three, as you can That's see. That's so hard, isn't it? To, to... It's very difficult to divide one egg into three like this. It's very, very difficult. Again, you can see the pussy tiny. willow. Yeah, and the tiny fish. And the tiny fish. And this is, I get immersed into my work till three, four in the morning, <laughs> and I get up maybe sleep an hour then go and say mass at eight o'clock and then back to work because it's snowing outside so that's how i work so this is the one with the fish it's very meditative work isn't it it's you it's must be a spiritual very kind of relaxing and yeah. very contemplative and it uh, it opens up another world to you you know the like when i mentioned earlier the 40 days of lent the 40 facets of life 
you begin to think of your own facets of life, the ups and the downs. And we all have them. You know, we've probably all got more downs than ups. And those facets of the life make us who we are. And I try to express all that on the egg. It's absolutely stunning. Um, how many eggs have you done over the years? How many eggs do you have now in your house? You know, that's a good question. Believe it or not, since talking to you, I started counting. But I really don't know. I've probably got a lot. I would say maybe three or four hundred, maybe more. But the little eggs. Then I've got, um, you can see at the back here, the cabinet, there's ostrich eggs in here. There's probably about 10 ostrich eggs in there about four rear eggs, and then various goose eggs and bantam eggs down here. There's quite a lot here. Given all told, probably five, six hundred. The thing is, uh, you know, they're there. I use them for exhibition purposes and different things. But I, it's very difficult when you go places, you have to pack everything up. It takes a while to pack and unpack Imagine. that you don't break anything. Did I break any eggs? Yes, I've broken eggs over the years. And I might show you something. This is a broken shell I'm working on now from a Tell rear more egg. about this? You're working on a broken egg. Why? Broken. The, the egg was broken. So I, took, I just broke it off and decided I'd work on this. And then I finished one broken egg. It was a rear egg. Here's the rear egg. And here's the broken egg, which I finished. And, and I uh, worked on it while it was broken. It's a talking piece when people come into the house. They say, oh, you broke the egg. I said, no, the egg was broken and I finished and it. We're just I painting it anyway. Egg. So that's oh. just something, that, you know, that I play with as well when I have the time. They're like jewels. They're like jewelry. So you must have done thousands in your life. Yes. Thousands in your lifetime. Yes. And sort of, I've been now with writing the book, I'm trying to trace my old eggs where they are. And they are in Poland, Ukraine, Rome, Paris, London, um, Belgium, and I think in Holland as well. They're, they're, they're all somewhere. And I'm, I'll, I'm trying to retrace them. And I've managed to trace some of them, not to get them back, just to get the photographs of them. But the, the, the person that did these eggs, I did these eggs, the old one that I showed you earlier, this, this one here, the very old one, not this one, the, the one I showed you initially, the um, the 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 one of the early days. Yeah. Those were the ones that uh, I'm trying to find. And somebody said the person I did them for had died. And so the son said, listen, you were looking for these. Why don't you keep them? And said, began. so I said, that's fine. And he kept one memory of his mother and they, get, they gave the rest back to me. Oh, which that's was nice. nice. And is it true that uh, your eggs are in the British Museum as well? Yes. Now of my early work, Four or five of my eggs at the British Museum in London, which was quite a shock. This came about in the last two years. And as time goes on, I think I'm going to be um, giving more to the British Museum. But that's an ongoing process, as we say in canon law, to be continued. Also, uh, the, con the can canonical term is to be determined, as we say. <laughs> you have to you have to catalogue you have to make a catalog and, and photograph them all paulo i think it's yes yes that's what it has to be done yes in your book but it hasn't been commissioned yet you're you're writing it for yourself for now or i'm writing it at the moment now yes you're right and i'm hoping i'm hoping somebody will edit it for me um i think we know <laughs> who, but without mentioning any names we know who will edit it <laughs> and it's going to have everything that kind of like we touched upon today from history yes, to, yes. to colors to yes. techniques and then there's, there's the legends that pertain to the eggs Please as well. Please tell us about the legends. That is one of the most fascinating things that you've told me previously. And I would like everyone... There are, there are many legends pertaining to the Ukrainian fisan came. One of them is regarding birds. As you know, in the springtime, the birds come alive. They're nesting. Beautiful. I have them out here outside now. The weather's beautiful today. And so I heard the birds singing here this morning and this afternoon. But um, in a little village in Ukraine... The poor peasants were working there and the birds, they would feed the birds and look after them as they did all the plant life, vegetation and the wildlife. And it was time for the birds to fly away. And so, but a bad storm came, the winter came, they couldn't fly. So these poor peasants, villagers, took the birds in and nourished them all through the winter. And when the spring came, the villagers went out and let the birds fly away. But the birds were so grateful for the help they'd got, 
that they came back with a little pisanka for each person that had helped them during the winter. And this is a legend I tell all the children I teach here in the church. Another legend pertains to the first pisanke that were colored. It is said the Blessed Virgin Mary colored the first eggs. She went to Pilate and with an apron of eggs, rolled them out and the tears fell on those eggs. And she pleaded for the life of Pilate. But of course, it didn't happen. And her tears colored the first eggs. And so on the Ukrainian Pesanke today, dots symbolize the tears of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So here I have an egg that you can just about see the dots at the side here that um, symbolize. Oh, this, is this is absolutely beautiful. So which ones are the, the, the little red dots are the tears? Yes, the little dots at the side there. The, yeah. They symbolize the tears. And this is divided into four as well. Oh, so, the colors on that, Paulo. Yes, and there's a lot of red prevalent in here, as you can see. But it's such a beautiful red. It's yes. so... It's such a, all of your palette is just so I so yeah you must be so good at mixing these colors. It it took years to experience the color situation to get them together, and finally yes, the red please. eggs. Uh, there's two more um, legend. The red eggs when the Blessed Virgin stood on the cross and the blood fell on the eggs and her tears. They were the first eggs that were dyed totally red. It's from the suffering of Christ. The last one is My about favorite. a monster chained to a cliff on a mountain somewhere. And every year, he sends people out into the world to see how many people are doing Pesanke. The more people doing Pesanke, then goodness, health will prevail. Everybody will be happy. If people aren't doing Pesanke, he, he spreads his terror all over the world with famines, wars, earthquakes, and everything you can think of. But if people do Pesanke, his chains tighten, and the people he sends out can't go any further, because people are doing Pesanke. So all of you watching here this afternoon, I hope you'll all do Pesanke, so that we don't have any monsters in the world that'll go out and create havoc, that those chains can tighten, and there'll be peace, harmony, love, and health upon the world. Oh, Paolo, I think that's such a beautiful way to finish. And it just makes me think that connection with, you know, with that meditative kind of practice and with that calmness and the creative force that it, that acts like this, you know, that craft and, and art like this instills in us and, um, and calms us. And I think that legend makes quite a lot of sense actually. I'm so, so grateful to you for your time and for your generosity. And I just wanted to ask you one last question. I know that they all must be like, you know, hundreds of children to you, but what is your favorite egg? Would that be the 40 egg one that you've shown us previously? Yes, yes. Can this we have another look at it, please? Because that you was a absolute masterpiece. I mean, to get even come up with this idea and to, and to, come up with those with those beautiful patterns it's incredible paulo well thank you this I one encourage I... also yeah yeah yeah. T tell us yeah yeah and then we'll go to questions as well because i'd really love people to ask you some questions if they have some it's exquisite it's just well, thank you uh, and and do you, you varnish and do you varnish them as well <laughs> yes i varnish them at the end actually years gone by i didn't varnish them what you did was, you when you cleaned the whole egg off, because of the beeswax, you took a soft cloth and just rubbed it, and they would give it a, a glean, a shine, because mm. of the beeswax. And some people do that. In fact, some, pe some people prefer uh, to see an egg unvarnished. They prefer, for example, here is, um, this is one I've done recently, and mm -hmm. it's not, I've not really shown it to anybody yet, but I can show it you here. Oh, On you. here, you can see the five sort of crosses here and the flowers and everything. That's facets of life, but also the five wounds of Christ. And that was done 
with the pussy willow and everything. This was done recently. At the side here, you can see the different van that's going round, the, with no beginning and no end. And then here, I class at the other side, it's chaos. Our lives are chaotic sometimes. And you can see the lines are not finished. The colors are not finished, even though they're symmetrical. It's a form of chaos that we all have. So I wanted to share that with you. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much, Paulo. Does do it, does anyone have questions? Please, I would love to. We would love to hear you, or if you want to write them down as well. The eggs are sublime. Liz says, "Great respect to you," and we've got incredible and wow, and a big heart. And if there are any questions at all, please don't be shy. Uh, Maria, that's a good question. Where do you find your inspiration? Good question. Um, I, when I'm traveling, I see things. For example, I go to museums, I go to old buildings, especially when you go to places like Pompeii and Greece and uh, Istanbul. You see different sort of designs that here and there. Uh, that meander all over the place. And it's then, you know, I or locally I see something. You know, I might just walk around and see something that attracts me. Or, or sometimes I've dreamt of things and I've got up during the night. I think, OK, I need to do this. So it, it comes to me periodically or I may see something wherever I am. And that gives me an idea of what I can do. That's beautiful. We've got another couple of questions. I've got one from Liz saying, do many people still decorate eggs? And also, do Ukrainians have egg fights like Russians do, just boil the onion skin? We've always did. We always did the egg fights, definitely, in my house. Uh, the wait, with, wait, with wait, the yeah, Russian yeah. kid. Yeah, yeah because yeah, they yeah, were yeah. boiled. That's it. Yeah. Now, the, it depends which region of Ukraine you came from. And they would... Um, you know, in the east or down the south, they would crack the egg, they were boiled. And the Greeks do that as well. So mm -hmm. that, because there is a Greek influence uh, in different areas. Yeah. And so they, they would do those things. Yeah. But people do do eggs. Um, I've taught many classes. There's some people, you know, all over the world, they do eggs. They do. They, everybody has a different an, hand. That's why I mentioned earlier, it wasn't one person in one village that decorated an egg. That was the standard for all the eggs, it was the different areas and certainly people do different things. The only thing for me in this modern world is when I see an egg decorated for Halloween, that's not what it's all about. And, and I think that's wrong, you see, you know, I find that um, I've actually mentioned that. And people, are, you know, they respect it. I said, because it's not, um, they do they do eggs now for Christmas as well. They make like, um, I've done one, where you can hang it on your Christmas tree, a star, it's a star over Beth, it's a pisanka. But when you start doing things like Halloween, they say we're going back to the pagan times. Well, you know, it's, it doesn't really mean that. You know, it's a, it's a symbol of life and everything. That's only an observation. Sure. We've got another couple of questions. Um... Susie says, what are you working on next? What design is in your mind? The next design will be probably something to do with an oval design on a rear egg. In fact, uh, I've got the rear egg ready here. Can this you just explain, one. so a rear is a type of, kind of like an ostrichy type yeah, it's of... A, it's a, yeah, a, it's a... A rear is equivalent to, to 10 chicken eggs. Mm -hmm. And an ostrich egg is equivalent to 12 chicken eggs. Okay. So and so you're going to do something on an oval rear egg? I'm going to do something on an oval rear egg, probably something to do with the stars, like I mentioned. You know, the stars and then the heavens and something in that line and vegetation. And also what I forgot to mention was also that I, um, I do uh, have eggs that, you know, I do different plant life and I've done reindeer. And I've also done like um, roosters because roosters and chickens are a symbol of fertility. When a if a girl wanted to get pregnant or be fertile, uh, you know the the husband would give her an egg. Hopefully, they should be fertile and um, be able to become pregnant and bring a child into the world. So those are the mm -hmm. things that uh, we have. In fact, I have something here which I did. It's uh, there's the the <gasps> dove, <laughs> oh. and here is and here is the reindeer. 
Oh, that's so nice. This is I don't so know if you wanted me to just demonstrate quickly how I melt the wax on. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can also, we've got another question as well for you. Okay, to... let me just get a cloth here. Sure. I I cl just excuse me a second while I get that's my cloth. That's fine. We will wait for you. Oh, Maria, that's a really good question as well. And there's a good one from Sonia too. So it's, um, I'm lighting the candle here. I'll, I'll lift it up in a minute and I'll show you what I'm doing. So um, here is the candle. Yeah. yeah. And what I'm going to do now is I take these stylus. I, I, not the stylus. I take the egg here. Yeah. As you can see. And I'm just on the side of the egg. I just do this. If you lift it up a bit. So we can see. Aha, uh -huh. so not directly over the flame because that no, can ruin it, right? Because of the carbon. If you do it over the flame, there's carbon and that will leave a black mark on your egg. So you just from side to side and then you take your little cloth here and wipe away. And as you can see already, there's a there's the Wow. That's that's the wax batik, and that's the process. You saw initially it was covered like this. Yeah, and now you see when you're removing it. it's not all removed, but that's just yeah. very quickly, simply to show you. That's amazing. I've got another question for you, Paolo. I've okay. got a, I've got a question uh, from Sonia. She's asking to create the different colors. Do you mix the yellow, orange, green, red, black to the desired new color, or do you use other specific dyes? How do you mix your? How do you create your shade no, different shades? The basic principle is you work from the light color. To the dark color no 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 but when yeah. you mix it when you're mixing your own your own kind of palette your own you know that beautiful aquamarine or whatever would you use yes the, that that was a dye i bought uh -huh. aquamarine and uh, the aquamarine i bought but the sometimes you have to mix the colors with the red and the yellow mm -hmm. but again sometimes it, it you have to experiment with it because sometimes i put black into some of the colors and the whole dye has turned black you know, really? you want to dark doesn't work in the same way if you're doing paint. Yes, so. you you have to experiment mixing the. I mix yellow and green. I've mixed I've mixed orange and red together. If you want to make a deep red, put orange with the deep red. Mm -hmm. But the thing to remember is the dyes that we use today they are aniline dyes. They're non edible, mm -hmm. and you have to mix it with hot water and distilled white vinegar, not malt vinegar. Never use malt vinegar. Always white vinegar. And the eggshells must be cleaned with a piece of Teflon and um, white vinegar and water, warm water. And ostrich dry. eggs, you also uh, yes. scrub a bit first. What do you have? Glaze. To... Are, are glazed. And you have to take the glaze off before you. you so they're naturally the... the glazed, then you have to scrub it off with a with sandpaper, or what do you use? Yes, you can do it with sandpaper. You can scrape it off with sandpaper. The thing is, you can try doing the egg with the glaze on and so it, but you have to dye the egg overnight and you do need bigger containers to immerse the ostrich egg in and bear in mind you have the hole at the end so you have to seal that hole with beeswax mm -hmm. very important and then immerse it into the dye it'll be a bit almost a, i use buckets so I buckets for the dyes <laughs> and then uh, take take the glaze off duck eggs are the worst eggs to work on because they're very greasy very greasy but going back to the mixing of the dyes, right. yes, you can mix yellow and yellow and green, orange and red. You can even try putting blue into uh, yellow, a little bit of blue. You just have to experiment a little bit here and there because you have to, people have tried to do it. It hasn't worked for them. And I've said just a little bit here and there. Mm -hmm. It's just it, it's all hit and miss because you, I, I, I've mixed some dyes here and I put them in and it hasn't worked. It just hasn't worked. Are you interested? Would you be interested? That's a question from me quickly. Uh, would you be interested to uh, explore kind of natural dyes? Have you have you known anyone who's who's worked with natural pigments to create? No, I, 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 no, nobody I've known. I, I, the only I've used onion skins but, and yeah. beetroot, but nothing else. Because but you I know that it's coming experiment. really want... into fashion, into you know, uh, people are now dyeing clothes with natural dyes. There's yes, there's all sorts yes. of 
kind of movements now going back. Yes, yeah, there know. is. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm I'm going to explore this for you, and I yeah. Well, anyway, we'll hear about this later. Okay, so we've got another couple of questions for you. Uh, Maria is asking, how do we continue and share the tradition of Pisanki so the monster stays chained up? There is so much competition from social media in today's modern world. How do we ensure that children and young people want to make Pisanki? They actually, children do want to make Pisanki. Not only children, many adults, many international people, international, I've been to many international groups who have taught uh, Pisanki. In fact, in New Haven, the Historical Society in Connecticut invited me to, it was a few years ago, to teach Pisanke all day to children from all over the world. They came from every corner. There must have been maybe 150. We did a session in the morning for the little children and for the older ones in the afternoon. And interestingly enough, all the little children with the candle flame and the, the kiskas and the beeswax, they were very careful. A couple of little children came, Father Paul, my egg's broken, so I very quickly had to put something to say, it's okay, here's an egg for you. So they <laughs> could go on with it. But yeah, many people want to learn eggs. I'm going tomorrow. I have a workshop in Enders Island this weekend, next weekend at the television. Many people want to do them. But what happens is people only do them like at this time of the year. They'll say, oh, it's Easter, let's do a piss on cat. They may do one or two and that's it. Whereas I'm doing them most of the year round, even though I didn't do them for about three or four months because I had other things to do. But uh, most people do want to do. That's why when I do these workshops, I always explain, they say, do piss and kick. Doesn't matter how bad they are. And in fact, the talks I give, the lectures, people make a mess of everything. It looks terrible. And I say, don't worry about it. And when they take the wax off, they are mesmerized because they see the beauty of what they've done, even with mistakes. You know, yeah. I've made mistakes. No two eggs are perfect. That's amazing. Paolo, can we get um a promise from you, please? I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. Can you come, please, next year, maybe, and we can do one here in my home at live, and then maybe an online one. And if people yes. have heard our talk today, I'm sure they'll be so thrilled to come and uh, okay. learn from you, I, to learn from you I, online. And we'll do it together online. So I'll assist you with all of the technology stuff. Yeah, thank you. We'll yeah, please do. And I'm I'm not very good. You know, actually, I'm not very good at technology. I try, but I'm not bad. I'm not the best. <laughs> so, so we'll it's, do it uh, together. I have people do it for me. But certainly, I'll be happy to come over next year and we'll do it. Fantastic. I've got one more from Sonia. She's asking, within the Ukrainian community in uh, Nottingham, we have Pisanka workshops each year. Since 2022, the workshops have been opened up to our English neighbours too. Oh, so it's not a question. It's, it's, it's just a statement. That's amazing that you've got, that there is you know, that it's happening, that it's, that's fantastic. It's great that it's, it's like I go not, in fact, I don't go to any Ukrainian organization, although they've asked me to go to the, the children next year in Hartford, but all the organizations I go to, they are all different nationalities, different groups. Uh, the group I'm going to tomorrow, I don't know anything about. The, there was um, in Southington locally, they had a, an art gallery there. They had me there for, actually two years for four sessions and uh, many people came and one or two Ukrainians came and they were shocked that, uh, you know, that this was going on and all the people that are interested, it's not just Ukrainians, many people are interested, but as I say, they may do one or two and that's it. But then, you know, it's to continue the tradition. And if you want to really develop your own technique, you have to keep going at it. You just have to, yeah, you just have to keep doing it. Like with anything, you know, they say 10,000 hours to get, you know, to the first level of kind of, yeah, mastery. Yes. I, I've got a question as well. Um, in our previous talk, uh, you mentioned that, you know, it, so it's a Ukrainian thing, but there's also other Eastern European countries around that practice that make yeah, the, Is that the, right? The, most East European countries, they all bless food. They, they do practice some form of egg decorating. Poland does it. Czechoslovakia does it. Um, Hungary does it. Uh, the different Slavic nations, they all have so they all do, they have their own tradition and their own designs, which are very different um, to Does what we do. Does that indicate maybe that was the Trapillion kind of culture? Is that where all of the kind of maybe Slavic? Yes, from the oh, Trapillion yeah. country, uh, culture centuries ago, it all developed from that. Yes, indeed. Fantastic. I've got one more question here from Liz. Um, 
What do you think of the shrink wrap sleeves you can buy? Do you know what that is? Yes, those are actually they're okay. You can they're really for boiled eggs to wrap around at Easter, bless them, and then eat the boiled eggs. They they have nice patterns on them. You can copy the patterns if you can do it. But as I say, I always start with the basic, like I told you, the start for people. I don't anything complicated. And yeah, th those are nice. You can um, use them for boiled eggs, ready for eating on Easter Sunday. Fantastic. Um, okay, let's have a couple of uh, more questions, if we have them. Otherwise, we're going to... I'm so gutted that you're not here this year. I really wanted to do this workshop with you, but I'm sure that we'll be able to do it next year. I, I just can't wait. I, I'm going to get the new diary in the next couple of weeks. So I'll put the diary in. And I'll fly. Let's, I'm get, let's get those dates in. I know that you have to be, you know, in your uh, parish. We'll, we'll do it. We'll, Easter, we'll but do beforehand. It. No, we'll do it beforehand. We'll do it. Definitely. Okay. Amazing. Oh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. It was, yeah, and for asking wonderful questions. Uh, Heather says, thank you, for uh, thank you so much for sharing your passion with us. And Susie says, thank you. And I, yeah, I thank everyone and thank you, um, Father Paul, for, yeah, for sharing your passion and your artistry with us and all of the knowledge. And we need your book in this world and we need you to keep teaching us. So please keep going. Thank, thank you. So you thank you, Olya, for your kind words. Thank you for having me. Thank you to all your Patreons. Thank you for all that have joined me here this afternoon. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Perhaps when I get back to England, I can meet some of you at some point. And definitely, Olya, I'll be coming over to your place to meet you <laughs> in person, <laughs> you know, Amazing. finally. And Judith says, thank you. I think I need to make a trip to Connecticut. Definitely. Okay. You're welcome to come here. Many people come here. Everybody's welcome. Anybody wants to come here, very well. <laughs> thank you so much. Sending all right. you much love. Bye. And a, ha a happy Easter to all of you. God bless. Happy Easter. Happy thank Easter. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.